Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. They stalked all the stay-at-home moms by Anonymous. I decided to share this after my husband encouraged me to share. I've been in therapy since this happened. I sleep with a gun next to my bed now. The light's on and I cannot be home alone. Here's what happened to me on May 23rd, 2017. In my neighborhood, we had had a few burglaries. I work from home and I'm usually home alone with my son. We live near a busy mall in our neighborhood, even though in a pretty good area. It's close to the highways and has three ungated entrants, so it makes it easy for people to break in, steal, and then get out before the police come. I scare pretty easily, so hearing an alarm going off nearby, or seeing the police helicopter circle above and having the neighborhood swarming with cop cars, always freaked me out. We had a spree of guys going into unlocked cars and stealing stuff. I mention this because there were 25 cars they were able to get into. Our area is the kind where you can leave your door open and usually nothing happens. And at that point, it had just been petty theft. Nothing major had been stolen and no one had been hurt. For the next few months though, everyone was pissed. We all felt really violated by what had been happening. There were homeowners meetings that were packed and everyone wanted to put a stop to the crime going on in our neighborhood. It was soon revealed that a rental property in the hood was the home to a drug dealer who was dealing more than just weed. He was selling hardcore stuff, and it was thought that a lot of the crime stemmed from his house. They had undercover cop cars throughout the neighborhood waiting to make a bust. Up until that point, it was pretty scary, but from a far away viewpoint. Also, at this point, no one had gotten hurt, at least not physically. Our neighborhood watch sent information to make sure our alarms were on, windows and doors were locked, and that if we left a car on the driveway, more than likely the burglars would skip our homes. We just had to lock our car doors. Since I worked from home, my car was always in the driveway. One afternoon in April, my son and I were on a walk. It was a nice day and about two blocks from our house, the cop cars came rushing in. I was told to go back into my house as soon as possible, and an officer actually escorted us to our door and let me know to lock all my doors. There were three armed assailants on the run between my street and the next. The men broke into two houses, and one a woman was home alone, and the three men raped her, tied her up, and left her there. They broke into a second home, and they pistol-whipped a man that was home. The next week, a woman was nearly kidnapped on a 6 a.m. run on my street. The fear was real at that point. Going out alone during the day or night just wasn't happening. None of the criminals were caught, but things died down. Usually every couple of days after there was a break-in, but there was nothing after this in early April. In late May, I had to take my car into the dealership for some work, so I was left without a car for two days. To keep my son busy, we would go on long walks to the mall with two other moms and kids. In the morning we would do this and then go swimming in our pool in the afternoon. A lot of the stay-at-homes grouped together because of fear of the recent things that had been going on. On that day, it was actually pretty nice out, so I had all of our sliding glass doors open and I was letting the house air out. While I was bathing my son, I got a funny feeling so I rushed and locked all the doors and blinds as quickly as possible. Even though it's in our backyard, I didn't feel safe leaving them open, with me down the hall in a bathroom. Just as I was walking away from the last door, I saw two large men entering my backyard on our security camera in the kitchen. We have three stations in our house where you could see the feed from the cameras inside and outside. We had one in our bedroom, one in the office, and one in the kitchen. My husband does security systems, so he had set us up with the most elaborate and expensive unit. We had two padlocks on the gate, so I was pretty freaked out that they were able to get in. These men were big guys, at least six foot and around 220 pounds, give or take. I'm 5'3 and 140. 
I'm not a tiny girl, but I would be no match for those guys. They started trying to look through our windows, so I edged back into the bathroom and realized that I had left my cell phone outside by the pool. I couldn't call anyone or get any attention from outside of my house. All I had was my work phone in the office, and that needed to be booted up to be used. I was on vacation for the week, so the system was shut down for the entire time. I grabbed my son, his diaper bag, and we made our way into my office. The room was pretty soundproof, and you had to be screaming for it to be heard outside. It had access to the security cameras and where we could actually hear audio from the cameras, and it had a heavy-duty lock on the door. My husband had set it up after the rape in the neighborhood so that it could be a panic room if we ever needed it. It was hidden in our garage, and unless you turned on all the lights in the garage, you'd have to walk around his tool bench in a high shelf. If you weren't looking, you wouldn't even realize that there was another room there. My son thankfully fell asleep on the rug in that room. And as I was freaking out watching these guys as they were using a little hammer to break the sliding glass door to enter my bedroom, I was getting the computer started up to call the police. But once they got inside, I was only able to see them in the living room kitchen in my son's room. They went into all five bedrooms in the house, rummaging through closets and drawers. The larger of the two men walked into the living room, He had my cell phone in his hand, and he literally looked at the camera in the living room and and waved at it with my phone in his hand. He then opened his bag, and he pulled out a knife, rope, and duct tape, and what I later found out were condoms. He then said, Hey, pretty mommy, where are you hiding? We want to have some fun with you. I realized these guys were not there to steal stuff. I finally was able to call the cops, and they told me to stay secured in the room, to turn out the lights, stay on the line, and be as quiet as possible. The guys were tearing my house apart, and they were calling my name looking for me. They even started calling out my son's name. That part freaked me out. How the fuck did they know our names? One of the assholes actually started eating the chicken I had baked for dinner. They were rummaging around through my laundry room, and one of them grabbed a pair of dirty underwear and inhaled deeply. It was the most disgusting thing I had ever witnessed, and I was praying that they wouldn't find us. They made their way into the garage and were looking around. I could only see a little from the kitchen camera, and I was praying that they wouldn't turn on the lights to see the entrance to the office in the corner of the garage. I was whispering into the phone, keeping the dispatcher up to date on what I was seeing on the security feed, and she told me the cops were four minutes out. The assholes began rummaging through the garage, and I heard them playing with my husband's power tools. My son woke up and surprisingly didn't start crying. He just quietly looked at me, sucking his thumb. I know exactly what those jackasses had in mind for me, and I was so scared to think what they were going to do to my son. That single thought brings me to tears even as I recount the situation to tell it. I brought my son into the closet of the room with a flashlight bottle and a blanket, and I mouthed for him to be quiet and then shut the door. The dispatcher told me the cops were three minutes out. Her name was Janice, and I begged her to tell them to hurry up. She told me to keep calm and that she was there with me. She had recommended that I get into the closet as well. I didn't because I didn't want them to think about my son if they broke through the door. Then, the guys started pounding on the office door. They were pulling at the door, and it sounded like they were throwing their weight into it. I heard my husband's power saw start up, and at that point, the bigger guy screamed, Bitch, I know you and the baby are in there. We are here to fuck you up. You should have just come out when we came in. I was literally shaking and praying that the door and the lock would hold up. I moved a dresser in front of the door. No idea why I did that, but it's what I always saw people do in the movies. I then pushed a futon in the room against the dresser, just praying the weight of the door would keep them out. I told the dispatcher what was going on and she told me the cops were breaking through my front picture window. 
I looked at the security system, and sure enough, there looked to be four or five cops at my door. The rest of this was a blur, and it felt like it was forever, with all the noises of taking the guys down, and then just silence. I was sobbing and rocking in the dark with my son in my arms, who sat there quietly hugging me and patting my back. Soon I heard a knock on the door. It was a female officer. It took me a moment to open the door, and I didn't even realize that I still had Janice on the phone. The guys were arrested, and they were caught with a large amount of cocaine, meth, and roofies on them. They had broken into the drug dealer's house before they broke into mine, and the cops later disclosed that they had been stalking and watching me for a few weeks. They knew when I was home all along, and that I was the next victim on their list. I thank God they didn't get to me, because I have no idea if I would still be here to tell you this story. We actually were able to sell our house two months ago, and we moved out of state. Our new neighborhood has a gated entrance. My house has security cameras in every room, and I have a gate around the entire property. To the rapist and burglars terrorizing my old neighborhood, let's never, ever meet again. Don't Hook Up With The Waiter by Rapline Please Sorry in advance, I was drunk most of the time during this happening, so I don't remember every detail. When I was 18 and freshly broken up with my way older boyfriend, I basically went crazy with dating guys. At the time, I also dressed very goth, even going as far as to wear a real corset and trench coat, mostly just enjoying the attention. One particular afternoon, my friend and roommate at the time decided to eat at a local Japanese restaurant, with both of us all dressed up. Our waiter was a mediocre, skinny white guy who clearly was a little alternative, but it was really hard to tell with the uniform. We joked about me leaving my phone number on the receipt or something, so I hyped myself up, and I did so. Later that night, he sent me a text. We talked for a few days, never really having the right time to meet up, as I worked 40 minutes away from where I lived. He mentioned his boots that he wore meant a lot to him, and some other odd things that just seemed like edgy jokes. One really late night coming home, I was texting and driving, as any 18-year-old does, and we decided to meet up. My stupid self invited him over to my apartment, where it was just me and the roommate who had been with me before. Our other two roommates weren't home. At first it was fine because I was already drunk, so I would just let him rant about whatever he wanted. He went on about his life, going to jail, medical bills, his parents, etc. And eventually he asked me if I wanted to see his tattoos, and I was like, okay. He lifted up his shirt, and not only could I see the handgun tucked in his waistband, but also his multiple badly covered up Nazi tattoos. One was even just slightly covered with a banana. I don't know what it was, but I simply decided the best way to deal with the situation was to appease him, so I went along with things casually. Like I said, I don't remember exactly every detail because it was over two years ago and I was drunk. But he ended up pulling his gun out and putting it to my head, asking me if I was scared. I was immensely confused and tried to call his bluff, saying I wasn't, which got him to put it away for a while. When we went to hook up in my messy-ass room, he pulled it on me again, saying he wanted to do it with it out. I got mad and tried to fight him off me and get that thing away from my head. Of course, I wasn't as strong as him, and he hit me in the arm with it, which that shit hurt because it was a nice one. When I finally got him off me and he realized I was pissed, not scared, he started acting like a crackhead, saying I was crazy for not caring about him pulling a gun on me. He ran out, jumped the fence of the apartment complex, and didn't even take his car that he had come in. In the morning, his car was gone and I had a large bruise from where he had hit me. Well, to me, this is now a funny story. I realize how bad it could have ended up. So to the waiter from the Japanese restaurant, let's not meet. Darker Than the Dark by Roshi My name is Roshi. 
I am a girl from Madhya Pradesh and currently living and studying in Bhopal. I've been in the city for almost four years now, and this series of incidents happened in the last apartment that I lived in. In May of 2023, I moved to this two-bedroom flat near my college. The area wasn't well developed yet, and I live alone, and as I had to move, I asked my mom to come for help. My flat was the very first flat when you climbed the stairs on the first floor. On the ground floor, there was just a parking lot. It was a six-story, newly built building with two flats on each floor, and the flats were beautiful, with two bedrooms and a hall in the center with three balconies. But strangely, the building was almost empty with just four flats occupied. On my floor, the first floor, I was the only person living. After moving there, my mom left for our hometown after a week, and then it was just me in the house. I was going through a bad breakup, and hence I tried to keep myself busy to stay distracted. Everything started on the day my mom left. I came home later on 12.30 in the morning from a party. I was in a good mood. I parked my car while humming a song, and I should mention that there is no lights in the parking lot or on the stairs or corridor of the first floor for some unknown reason. I started to climb the stairs with my flashlight on when I heard a sound from the parking lot as if someone was whistling the same song which I had just been humming a minute ago. I ignored it, thinking there must be some guy teasing me. While I was unlocking the door, I felt a cold breath on the backside of my neck as if someone was just behind me. I turned around to see, but there was no one there. I got into bed thinking, how is it possible that in the month of May I felt a cold breath since there were no windows in the corridor? Anyway, I shrugged it off and listened to low music until I slept. Around 3 a.m., I woke up with an uneasy feeling as if someone was around. I got a drink of water and was again trying to sleep when I heard the sound of a jingling bell from the hall. I thought it had to be my cat as she wears a collar with a bell on it, but then I realized that she was sleeping just next to me. So I got up to see what was happening and I found no source for the sound. It continued for almost an hour and then it stopped. During that period, I could still feel that I wasn't alone in the house, and I was scared. I only slept after the sunlight broke. I started to have nightmares and sleep paralysis very often, and the dreams were very realistic, and I often used to wake up screaming. Once I had a dream that I was sleeping on my bed as usual, and some black creature that seemed to be like a man walked in. It came right to my side and held my hand, and I couldn't move and then the thing bent towards my face and went near my ear humming a song. I woke up screaming, thinking it had to be a nightmare. When I got up from my bed, it was already 7 a.m. I went to the kitchen to make some tea, and that's when I noticed my wrist, and I saw marks of four fingers, as if someone indeed had held my hand tightly. Strange things kept happening. I always felt that someone was always around me, whether I was cooking, bathing, doing my assignments, whatever. I always felt that whatever it was, it wanted to harm me. On July 8th, I was in an accident which injured my ankle. I had to go through a painful surgery and was on my bed rest for at least three months. My mom was back to take care of me, and one of my male friends also came to stay there to help us. He too felt uncomfortable, but he never told us the reason. Things kept happening. My mom used to sleep in the other room since she felt suffocated in my room and told me to call her if I needed anything. She said she always used to hear sounds from my room as if I was talking to someone in a low voice. More like whispering, but a bit louder than that. When she'd check on me, she would only find me sound asleep. She heard those voices even when she was alone when I was taking physiotherapy sessions daily in the evenings. She was sure that those voices, sometimes whispers, were similar to mine. Doors and windows opened and shut swiftly on their own in front of our eyes, though we had heavy wooden doors that had zero effects from winds. The flat beside us was vacant, but we used to hear sounds from the common wall that we shared with that flat. It sounded like someone was banging or hammering a nail on that wall at night. I mean, the sounds were very clear. On a day after I got better... I was again alone in the home since Mom had gone back to our hometown. I had gotten used to the things happening around me, 
But that night something happened that was the final nail in the coffin. I had my exams going on, so I was studying in my room late at night around 3.30 a.m. All the lights were off except for my room in which I was studying. And suddenly I was distracted by a sound like someone was scratching the wall in the hall. Since my cat does scratch things, I thought it had to be her. But just then, she came running towards me at an unusual speed with her tail high up like she was scared of something. I was petting her, and then I heard the same sound again. I moved a bit to see what was making the sound, only to find a shadow-like person, darker than dark, with its shiny white eyes peeking at me from behind a pillar in the hallway. Chills went down my spine. I can't even describe how horrifying that scene was. I could clearly see this thing looking right in my eyes with so much hatred, like it just wanted to kill me. I froze there for a while. My mind wasn't working. I wanted to scream my lungs out, but couldn't even utter a word. I stood there thinking that this was the end of my life. I tried to recite holy verses, but my mind just would not catch anything. Somehow I started to pray to God in my mind, asking for help, and then I gathered the courage to move and slam the door of my room, screaming out God's name. I fell on my bed crying when I heard a loud bang of my room's door. It was not like knocking, but as if someone had banged his whole body against the door. I was crying with my mouth shut. I quickly grabbed my phone and put a Quranic verse audio on speaker that would keep evil away. The banging slowly faded away within a while, and I was still afraid and couldn't sleep that night. Once the sun broke, I locked my flat and ran to one of my friend's places, obviously along with my lovely cat Layla, and called my mom to come as soon as possible. She came the same day, and we vacated the flat right away. Inquiring further with the neighbors who lived on the second and third floor, we got to know that they all felt this negativity around there, and the banging on the doors at midnight was a normal thing for them now, too. They were all boys living in a group, and they told us that the reason the building was empty and that no one stayed there for more than two months, even though they were about to leave the place soon. They were amazed that I had managed to stay there for seven months. Anyway, I've now moved to another apartment, and things are peaceful here. The Man Who Tried to Grab My Dog, by A Fish Named Noel. This happened in 2019 when I worked in Charlotte, North Carolina. Both my dogs are small, 14 and 9 pounds, so we frequented a park that divided the dogs by weight. Nala, my 9-pound Chawini, stuck pretty close to me after surveying the perimeter and losing interest, soaking up attention from strangers who were often in awe of her cute deer-shaped head and unusually spotted coat. Sasha, my dachshund rat terrier mix, is generally pretty aloof with strangers, if not downright avoidant. Her one focus at the dog park was to chase her ball and bring it back to me to throw again. She can repeat this cycle until she is physically exhausted. I mean, nothing distracts her from the goal of a fetch. That day at the park, there were several other dog parents with their pups, enjoying the sunny weather and watching over the herd. I was able to recognize some of them from past visits, and you can usually associate dogs to owners pretty quickly. I noticed a man near the entrance who didn't seem to have an association with any of the dogs. He just walked the perimeter of the fence slowly, watching all of our dogs and smiling. He wore a cap that attested to his service as a veteran. Every so often, someone would thank him. I made light conversation with a couple other dog moms and continued tossing Sasha's ball, keeping a discreet eye on the smiling veteran as he continued to float along the fence line. I made mental connections in my head to each of the dogs and their owners and decided that this man did not have a dog in here. At one point, the man entered the fence and began interacting with the dogs that approached him. It appeared harmless, like maybe this was just a form of free pet therapy for him. I lowered my guard and stopped watching him. Eventually, though, he took interest in Sasha's adept fetching skill and approached me. That wasn't unusual. Many people are often entertained watching her take off like a furry jet after her ball and then returning it every time to my feet for me to throw again. 
What made this interaction strange was that after the usual questions of you know, how long did it take her to learn that, she must be very smart, etc., he started asking me things like if she'd been fixed, how long had I had her, and commenting that for a seven-year-old dog she still appeared very youthful and spry. He then asked if he could throw the ball for her, and I told him that she wasn't particularly friendly to strangers, and no matter who threw the ball, she would only ever return the ball to me. He asked to try anyway, and I allowed it. As predicted, Sasha made a wide loop around him on her return with the ball and dropped it at my feet. He tried to beckon her to him, tried to pet her, and she ducked out of his reach and ran behind me. He asked me to try throwing the ball again, and I told him we were about to wind up for the afternoon. Something about him made me uneasy. He walked away, but not before trying to swipe his hand over Sasha's back, which she avoided. I decided to toss the ball for Sasha one last time before leaving. She raced out and caught the ball mid-air, then began a slow trot back to me where I was waiting with her leash. The man, whom I didn't even realize was standing so close to me, leapt forward into her path and tried to grab her. Without missing a beat or dropping the ball, Sasha weaved out of his reach and ran between his legs straight to me. I started screaming at him, asking him what the hell he was doing and demanding that he never touch my dog, especially after I had already told him she isn't friendly. The other pet parents began approaching, including a beagle mom I saw here often and had a friendly relationship with. The man quickly left the dog park, jumped into an older Mustang and peeled out of the parking lot. The other pet parents started discussing how they'd seen him lurking around the dog park before, but he'd never tried anything like he did until today. So, creepy possible dog napper? Let's never meet again. Escorted Out of the Woods by Anonymous This was a few weeks after Christmas one year, and I was out taking pictures for some new projects. I was off-road about 15 miles with 12 to 14 inch snow on the logging road. I had driven these roads many times throughout the seasons, and my truck was more than able to get me through the drifts. It was about 2 p.m. when I entered the forest to one of my favorite places to shoot, an old abandoned homestead. There were about three to four crumbling old log buildings there, and it made for interesting subject matter. I wanted to catch the right light. There were some older snowmobile tracks under the weak old powder, but no other signs of people being around. It was about minus ten and no wind, so a nice winter day for photography. The shadows were getting longer, so I got out of the truck and started walking towards the edge of the clearing. I shot for about an hour and a half, when I got the feeling I wasn't alone anymore. I've seen coyotes, moose, deer, and the odd bear out here, but the wind was blowing from behind me, so they would have smelled my scent and vanished. There was a rumor of a wolf pack, but I doubt I would have heard them. The aspen stands are difficult to see into, and your eyes can play tricks on you, too. I just shrugged it off his nerves and kept looking for that ultimate sunset shot. I looked toward my truck, which was about 500 yards to the south of me. I'd wandered pretty far, and I'd left it open, and the keys were in it out in the woods, just in case I fell down or dropped them in the snow. I didn't want that to happen. I figured at that point I had enough pictures for the day and put my camera in my backpack and started walking back towards the truck. And this is where things get strange. The snow was knee-deep and tough going. And again, I got that feeling that I was being watched. I glanced over my shoulder, but nothing was there. And I just kept going following the tree line about 30 feet away along a frozen creek. And then I heard it some small twigs snapping in the woods about 150 yards away. This was the thickest bush, with one to two feet of deadfall, along with powdered snow about two feet deep. I mean, it wasn't easy going for any creature out there. I picked up my pace to a fast trot. I didn't need to meet up with a bear who had yet to go to sleep for the winter. And then I started to hear actual footsteps, and it or they were running through the woods either alongside my path or towards me. I didn't stick around to find out. I ran for my truck, which was about 150 yards from me at that point. 
The sun was nearly gone, which made me even more scared. I darted across the clearing, reached the truck with the trees snapping just 200 feet away. There was now a definite grunting, like an elk, but much, much deeper. As I fired up the truck and started to turn it around, I saw the pines shaking and snow falling off them in the last light of day and the bouncing truck lights. I went back two weeks later and found snapped off six inch saplings, but that was about it, as it had snowed two to three feet over the weeks. This was at an elevation of about 4,200 feet. Later, I told a friend about the incident, and he just said, Bigfoot. And then he told me of an encounter on the same road which was far more dangerous than the year prior. I've since moved away from British Columbia. I've shot, camped, and ridden horseback throughout North America's backcountry and encountered many animals, human and non-human. The sounds that I heard out there that day, though, were not made by any animal I'd heard before or since. The Office in the Middle of Nowhere by Bora K. 111 When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them where you were available, and they'd send you up to a remote farm for a few weeks where you'd do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it was covered roughly the same landmass as the state of Maryland, USA. It was about nine hours from Sydney City, and the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy named Jeremy who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot, and the work was hard, so one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius, which is about 100 Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a watering hole on the farm about a 25-minute drive north. I was keen for a swim, but the other guys just wanted to relax for the afternoon, so he and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes, however, he suddenly pricked up and jabbed me in the ribs. Do you see that over there? Beneath the two dead trees. I should mention here that if you're not familiar with inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer, we realized that it was a huge blue shipping container, just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed. I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said that he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about five weeks before, and he wanted to go and see what it was. Initially, we pulled to a stop about a hundred meters away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate. Which I understood, given that it was his property. But in truth, I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side, all motion activated so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, With all this security, somebody obviously doesn't want us here. Let's just go. He brushed me off, however, reminding me it was his farm, and whoever had put this here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on the huge door. We had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. 
The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light, but I could already see this place was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high. And there were plastic storage boxes scattered around the far wall, with several desks of computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desks to see if the computers could give us any idea of what the hell had been going on here. My heart was racing, and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by the CCTV, so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy, on the other hand, was adamant that we had to get to the bottom of this, so I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my lay position is that it was endless lists of computer talk. It was like the old Napster or LimeWire download screens looked like, just constantly picking up and receiving data, then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then I was pretty sure no one else was there as there was nowhere to hide really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided, against my better judgment, to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief sift through this box still makes me feel sick to the stomach. It didn't take long for me to realize that this box was full of posters, DVDs, and photos, all of hardcore child pornography. One thing that still gets to me is that this was all neatly ordered into folders and smaller boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up, and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, Mate, get out. Child sex, go, get the fuck up. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into his truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception, and we hadn't brought the satellite phone, so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour from the town closest to the farm. As I mentioned, it's very remote. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen, until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we immediately jumped out and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open, and there was a fire inside. We only had two small extinguishers in the cars, and these did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, by which stage most of the damage had already been done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described, and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property, and the landmass was huge, so there was no real way to tail them. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to our poor explanation on the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still sitting there on the farm as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. Never Far From My Mind by Rome London Paris This happened quite a long time ago, yet it is never too far from my mind. We continue to feel very lucky to have survived whatever might have happened. 
It was a long time ago, before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mom in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office was an hour away from our home, and I was just taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day, and for that we were grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off of a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction. But it was a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep Cherokee we had owned for two years, was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we arrived. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we waited. Then we saw the doctor, paid, and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot as I loaded the children in their car seats for our trip home. But as the receptionist locked the front class doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in and asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book, and the man I spoke to said that he would come, but it might be a bit. So I told him my location, left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows, and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. Soon we watched as all the lights were turned out in the building again, and everyone left, their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light out, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through the car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot, etc. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot pretty soon, and a man got out of his pickup, smiled and nodded to me, and said he was going to raise the hood. He was middle-aged and a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially at the end of the day. I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine. But he seemed to be taking a long time checking the connections, and I longed for him to just grab jumper cables. Yet he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong, and he said, Oh, it's just a loose wire, not the battery, and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were slightly visible through that long, horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up there real quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything, as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again just waiting for the inevitable signal to try to start the ignition that was most surely coming any moment. At one point, I remember thinking that he was definitely flirting as he spoke, but I was trying above all to be polite and kind, as he was indeed helping us. We were hot and tired and miserable, and truthfully I was distracted with the kids. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little frustrated with me, because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad where he left us there all alone with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled into the desolate parking lot. And as it did, this nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it, and drove away very quickly without even saying a word of goodbye. I was both confused and a little anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little frightened that he had suddenly left me there alone with two little ones, defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was in the parking lot next to me now? It certainly seemed the southerly gentleman thing to do. I looked around and was very aware once again that there were no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses nearby and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new, also unmarked pickup pulled in next to me, 
I got out of the car once again, this time more apprehensively. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself, and his name and voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and started towards the road pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I just smiled back in surprise and told him, Well, I don't know, I thought all this time he was you. We both laughed slightly as he then grabbed jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood, and started to work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that, with luck, that air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly, and once again check the children. While listening for the familiar words, try it, I had my back completely turned towards the children, when he surprised me by suddenly coming over to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice, he said, Um, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hands, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-like looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish rust. Yet on one end it had tiny circular small finger holes, as if it was a mix of a long, thin sword and scissors, oddly combined. I remember being amazed but not frightened, and I asked where he had found them. Under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter-of-factly, that I had never seen them before. But how weird was it that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years, and I shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them, unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale, too, like he couldn't find the words to speak for a bit. He just continued to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care about it one bit. All I could think of was getting the car going, letting me pay him, and the cost of this, and then leaving. He didn't say anything else. He just quickly set them on the curb, started his truck, and then signaled for me to start the jeep. And when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered. Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, aimed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so I could hear the amount now owed. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side, but instead of handing me a bill, irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Ma'am, he said slowly, I want you to look at these one more time, and held them out for closer inspection. This time, I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item still appeared incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet-looking quality except for the strangely small two loops on one end. I'd never seen anything like it and told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. These weren't hidden somewhere in the engine, ma'am. They hadn't been there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there. I shook my head no and half smiled as I said, but they're obviously very old and rusty. To which he pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp they are? These look like they've just been sharpened. And when I looked down, he was right. The long, skinny, dagger-like shape was unusual but by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. The edges at the tip where the rust had been removed were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm really glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I probably needed to call the police when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't want to touch him, I didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so he could place it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way, me turning the other towards the small winding highway that would lead home, still an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment we arrived home, and I got the children inside safely. 
but although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like things to them later. The officer I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears, from my description and measurements on the phone, which I found quite disturbing, as you can imagine. I remember wondering how he would even know that, why he would say that. I had tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping that they might be able to lift prints or test it for blood if they wanted. But the story seemed to bore him a bit, and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated that, as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the very end of the call, as if to wind things up, he did say that it sounded as if I was very lucky, and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper and placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, and there they remained for several more years untouched until we moved away, and I finally, not wanting to bring them across several states, reluctantly threw them in the trash. Around that time, though, if you look through old newspaper reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I've often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did, if my children would still have a mother, if I would have still had my son and daughter, if I would have missed all those years with them. I guess I'll never know but I learned something very important about myself that day. I had always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading people, and staying safe. But because I was exhausted and tired and hot and stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit and wasn't working at that time. And many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day and my lack of awareness could have easily cost us our lives. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on this channel or my podcast, send it to Uncle Josh True Scary Stories at gmail.com. I read them all. We're gearing up for Easter time, so if you've got any scary Easter stories, please do share them with me. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Hit the notification bell for every time that I upload. Follow me on social media. Links to that are in the description. And if you'd like to up your game and support the channel even further, there's a link to my Patreon page, as well as my storefront at tpublic.com. Get yourself some Campfire Crew merch. Everyone. Be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.